Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 59. Let's go with that. It could not be, but that's what I think it might be. It's probably 59. Yes. Lovely, lovely, heady heights of episodes. How are you, Nick? I'm all right. Yeah. Can't yes. complain. But the, but the sun's out, so that's good. Sun, like having the sun out. Uh, uh, the sun's out and guns out, Nick? No. no oh, okay. None fine, of that. Fine, 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 fine. You don't like to stroll to work in a wife beater vest? I don't. No. No, no. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shorts are only worn in the, the, the most dire of circumstances. <laughs> um, I remember when you first messaged me that you were wearing a pair of shorts in all of our, in the years of our friendship. And it went round our friendship group texts. Everyone was like, but Nick has shorts? What? Nick's wearing oh. shorts. Oh God, oh God, what's happening? Is he dying? <laughs> I mean, this only happens when I visit the face of the sun. It has to be that, <laughs> that level of heat. So yes, no, we're not, we're not there yet. We're not there yet, but it's been a beautiful week. The shops have been open. Things could be bought. I have bought everything in Lush. You have bought I all I have things. had... All the brunches everywhere. I've done nothing but have brunch all week. It's been marvellous. See, I have been at work all this week, so I have had none of this joy of brunch or shopping or anything like that. So, I no. wisely booked this week off. I didn't actually know at the time that this the would plan be the for week. the shopping. Okay, yeah, I know I didn't I'm going to shop. And yes, I bought many a thing. I, I'm, I'm not even kidding. It was like the scene from Black Books where Manny, Manny yeah. <laughs> walks into the bookshop, the bookshop. and <laughs> walks out bewildered with the bags. I did that today in fat face and next for no reason. And I now have no money left, but I have some fabulous dresses. Excellent. <laughs> it's good. Oh, well, any poisonings this week, Nick? Uh, I don't believe that. So. I've been a bit busy to notice, really. Um, so, oh. I mean, again, it's one of those situations that, I mean, there could have been loads. Um, yeah. I imagine with the the pubs now being open, there's been a lot of alcohol poisoning going on. Um <laughs> That's true. Around, around the country. Um, but, well, speaking of alcohol poisoning around the country and uh, wandering bewildered around with bags of shopping, I think it's time for us to thank our Patreon subscribers. Yes, we should. We should. Um, I was going to say something else, and I don't know what it was. So thank you so much to <laughs> Stephanie Bayless. To Maria Guaneri white And to Shan Davison. Thank you, darling people, for joining thank us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're all very, very sexy. We love you so much. Oh. Thanks for joining us. Patreon has been fun this week. Well, it oh, oh, was... Well, yeah, mm, uh, it was... Mm, mm, <laughs> I, I think mm. fun is perhaps pushing it slightly. Interesting. <laughs> informative. As Nick's episodes always are. Absolutely. They're interesting and informative. They're not fun. They're not fun. They're not I don't fun, do fun. People. <laughs> I do educational, not fun. <laughs> we went into dark territory. But you know what? It's okay. It's okay. We had a good debate going. You know what? If you want to know what we're talking about, you have to come and join us on Patreon. Uh, it's worth it. Trust me. Yeah. Well, Nick. Hello. Are you ready? Mm. To drink cocktails and talk about poison? No, I'm quite enjoying my fizz. I don't want cocktails. But we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. I don't want to do that either. No? Well, it depends on the type of Prosecco you're drinking. Because some Prosecco is poison. This is the good Prosecco. But okay, fine. Let's have a cocktail. Let's have a cocktail. <laughs> what kind of Prosecco are you drinking? Tell the lovely people. I have the lovely Definition Prosecco. <gasps> oh. It's a good Prosecco from my favourite Prosecco shop. That is magic Prosecco. People, people, just as a little side note, but go with us here. Not all Prosecco is created equal. Indeed not. But in England, Majestic, the wine merchants, they're not sponsoring us. They give us no money. <laughs> they should. I give them money, an awful lot we of money. give them a lot of money. They have their own brand, Definition Prosecco. If you have not tried it, go and buy it because it's delicious. It's very good. So I have that. But I want a cocktail too. I'm greedy. <laughs> okay, fine. We're going to go with the first one. Hooray, hooray, hooray. We can't, we can't, we can't possibly tell a story without a cocktail in hand. Nick's story this week. So he got to choose the secret ingredient. As you know, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell that would flavour our cocktail of the week. So Nick, this week's secret ingredient is... Well, I'm going to say it's more of a location than an ingredient. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, tell us what it is. It's a, it's, a, mm. it's a bathtub. And a bathtub is not so much a location. I love no. the way you say it's a location. It's a location. It's a receptacle. No, I'm thinking it's a place to be. <laughs> this is where you invite your friends to meet you, clearly. Exactly. Yes. Party at my house, location bathtub. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I've had many a 
party at a bathtub. That sounded really wrong. Wow, Nick. Shouldn't have, yeah. We are going to need to have all the details right now. <laughs> should have, should think, think before I say things. I <laughs> so you said bathtub, but now, now, now be honest, Nick. Is it bathtub or is it bathtub gin? Well, yes, there is some, certainly some gin involved. Yay. Yay. <laughs> now, love a bathtub gin. We've all made one. Oh, God, absolutely. <laughs> but I have to, I have to say, Okay, this is, again, say more about me. But if I have a bath, and I do, I like a bath sometimes, <laughs> and a relaxy bath. Um, I'm a relaxy bath person. And I often, I will make a gin when I'm going to have a bath. Call it my bathtub gin. You have it in a glass, though. You don't just pour it liberally over yourself in the bath. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I love that little insert into your life there. I like, I like a relaxy bath. <laughs> I haven't done it for a while, actually. Ooh, Later, this after this podcast, Ooh, it's been a chilly later. day. Give me ideas now. I enjoy a relaxing bath as much as the next person and enjoy a gin with it. This is actually a really good question. Maybe this shows how much we've drunk before (laughs) this episode started. But people, what is your ultimate bath drink? If you like a relaxy bath, what's the drink you've got? (laughs) Is it a champagne? Is it a Prosecco? Is it a gin and tonic? Is it something more complex? Is it a red wine? Mm, Warming. Oh, no, you can't have a red wine in the the bath. (laughs) Why not? I I don't know. It seems weird to me. You're just putting your foot down now. I am. (laughs) See, that seems sleep inducing. Yeah, and you don't want that in a bath. No, you don't want that in a bath because that leads to drowning. Alcohol is also sleep inducing. Yeah, but not alcohol in the bath is not a good idea. You're warm and cozy and you have a nice red wine it's like oh i'm falling asleep now you want something lively like a gin or a fizz or something like that to go Whoa. i've thought about this a lot you very clearly have anyway we're not in the bath moving on okay so with bathtub and gin as your inspiration what have you come up with well with gin bath a bathtub gin we have gone for a lovely 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 cocktail i thought okay well this week i want a nice drink I want a nice drink this week. I want one that is going to be a good one. I don't want any risks. Don't we all? I'm not in a risky yeah. mood this week. So we are making a classic, a delightful drink. We are making a casino number one. Casino number one. I have not had a casino number one. Have you not? No. Ah. I've heard tell. This is the drink. This is the cocktail that got me into cocktails. Really? This is one Aww. of the first cocktails I had as a grown person that got me into making cocktails where was it and what happened and why so i was out with my brother-in-law and my sister and we were having a jolly time and he said try one of these and i did (laughs) and it was marvelous and it was a casino number one was it actually casino number one or did he just slip you anything at that point take this it's ribena and gravy drink it down and you went "Mm, casino number ones are marvelous (laughs) no no it was definitely casino number one and it inspired my love of cocktails without which we would not be here today this is adorable Nick's backstory has a special place in my heart. Well, Nick has, as ever, delivered me some secret ingredients. So I think it is high time for us to disappear into our isolation kitchens and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. A casino number one. Casino number one. The first of the casinos, apparently. The first of casinos. And I'm not, I must admit, I've never actually heard of a casino number two. I have. I have. Have you? Oh, fair I've, enough. Uh, actually, you know what? I don't think I've heard of casino number two. I'm convinced I've heard of casino number three. Potentially. Because I think it probably has absinthe in it or something. Maybe. I've never encountered a casino number one, but I've encountered a casino number three and went, why is it number three? What happened to the first two? <laughs> well, now we know what happened to one of them. <laughs> but we have the beautiful cocktail. It's it's sort of clear. We're going away yes. from the brown drinks. We are very much away from the brown. It looks very pretty. I like it. I like it. And I'm sensing there's bathtub gin in this. There is most certainly a bathtub gin. I've been ladling and brewing all night i had been brew, brewing it brewing do you brew gin distilling yeah so i brewed some gin in my bath last night so we have to taste it first nick will not reveal a single thing about this cocktail before we dive nope. in and taste it i'm excited i'm excited yeah. by this i like this is one of my absolute favoritest ones you're good at the classic cocktails, so i'm oh i'm intrigued okay so we're mm. gonna dive in and try this absolute classic at casino yes. number one cheers merry christmas Oh, God, that's lovely. It is. It's so good. It's so crisp and clean (sighs) and simple, but just mm, so good. Yeah. I know there's gin. I know that there's gin. We've talked about that. (laughs) There's a citrus... But there's a little something else in there, which I'm intrigued about. Oh my God, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Talk us through it, Nick. 
Well, Andy, so we do absolutely. We have some gin. Uh, yeah. We have, in this occasion, we have bathtub gin, but you could most certainly use any gin you had. Um, we have citrus. We have lemon juice. We also have maraschino cherry. Yes, that's it. That's the one. And as if you've listened to us long enough, you'll know I bang on about this stuff quite a lot. Um, and it's in a great many cocktails that we make. So it's definitely worth a bottle. And we also have some orange bitters, which adds, add a Ooh. hint of complexity to it. And it is just a simple and delicious cocktail i think we'd go out on a limb here and say we would advise people to get these orange bitters always have a little selection of bitters no, you're never going to go wrong with it maraschino cherry liqueur we've had some of the finest cocktails on this show i mean ab- absolutely i mean gin bourbon both work really well with maraschino and there are some great ones and it's not horrendously expensive in the uk for a 70 cent little bottle i pay around about 17 18 pounds yeah also, I have no idea what this availability is in the US, but I mm. imagine it is going to be around. Yeah, do tell us, people, because it is, it's is—it's a lovely ingredient and it just gives it this, it's not overpowering. You would think a cherry liqueur, because it's maraschino cherry, you would think it would be overpowering and sweet. And you really can't substitute a lot for it. I know in the past we've used mm. cherry brandy in some cocktails. Maraschino cherry liqueur, it's the subtleness of it. It just gives you this beautiful not overly perfumed not overly sweet but lovely something that's what it is it's a something in the background and that is a glorious cocktail oh i'm so glad we're having that tonight (laughs) it's a good drink i'm I'm pleased i'm very jolly now nick nick on this occasion i did know the gin that we were using because we said bathtub gin now bathtub gin we have used abelforth's bathtub gin which is a fantastic fantastic gin they're not sponsoring us we're not getting anything from this they're just (laughs) really really good this is a british gin and it comes in a beautiful bottle uh, which i will photograph later beautifully wrapped and very old timey this old uh, old brown paper wrappings and things it's very fancy looking it's very sexy they do a bathtub gin they do a standard gin they do one of the finest slow gins i've ever tasted and i've Mm. tasted a lot of slow gins and this one (laughs) is outstanding but they have a bathtub gin and the one we've used today is an old tom Mm -hmm. do you know the story about old tom gin nick i think you're going to tell us a story oh i think regardless of whether you know or not regardless if i know it or not you're going to tell everyone well the the whole idea behind bathtub gin uh, you know we go back a few decades you're going into the prohibition era where people are just mixing liquor in their bathtubs just to try and find anything that will resemble (laughs) liquor in the days of prohibition but back 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 even further you have gin houses and you have a would-be distillers very much in inverted commas and sort of making bathtub gin that was then labeled gin this very vague strange kind of gin that they were making and selling on the streets now of course gin comes back from Geneva from Holland and when people started making gin in London there are legends about where the name Old Tom gin came from and there's two which I'll tell you very quickly one is more disgusting than the other <laughs> well I think we definitely want the disgusting one yeah we definitely um, want the disgusting one I'll start with a nice one I'll start with no, a nice-ish fine. one on, in the times of gin lane and beer alley so obviously there was a period of time where gin was was just the devil's drink it was awful and it was debauchery gin led to debauchery mother's ruin mother's ruin the poor people were drinking gin there were massive taxes well there were massive pro you know restrictions on the selling of gin so people had to get their gin surreptitiously and there is a legend that certain places certain bars or certain establishments would put a sign of an old tomcat above a window and that you would tap on the window and a cat's paw mechanism or there would be a sign of a cat's (laughs) paw and you would put money on it and a shot of gin would come out so that's one legend about old tom gin that you would look for the sign of the cat and that you would go and get gin my personal favorite story Mm. people were distilling gin as best they could in a pub people coming in and treating it like grog but the legend happened that some people were coming into one bar and they were buying the gin, the grog-like gin, and they were quaffing it down. They were like, oh, it's got a piquant to it. You know what? It's got a certain <laughs> flavour. It's got a certain flavour that we end. Oh, 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 this is so good. Ooh, the botanicals, they were saying. The botanicals, Ooh, the can't botanicals. can't taste the botanicals. Mm. Of course, what it turned out is an old tom cat had found its way <laughs> into the distilling still and drowned. And 
no one had noticed and the gin nope. was distilled. <laughs> and what had happened is they produced gin distilled around a dead cat. Nice. And it had given it a very delicious I'm flavor. I'm sure it was a unique flavor profile, it has to be said. Oh, so tasty. So tasty. <laughs> oh, the cat. So there you go. That's the other theory about Old Tom. That's much, but that's much it more is. fun. It's Old Tom gin. It tastes so good because it's got dead cat in it. Now, I do not advocate the killing of cats to put into your homemade liquor. Please don't do that. So you can, you, you can imagine sort of like, oh, their gin's really popular. Why is it so popular? Oh, it's got a dead cat in it. Therefore, loads of other distillers going around f- hunting cats <laughs> to put it in their own gin to make it just as tasty. Or trying to ramp it up a notch. Just going like, we'll put a yes, dog in it. Yeah, dogs, elephants, bring The Canadians on. are going, put a moose, a moose. It will do good. <laughs> Just give us some Kahlua and we'll be on our way. So there you go. There's a brief interlude into the history of the old Tom Gin. Good story. And for a delicious cocktail. But enough of this frivolity. We have our casino number ones firmly in hand. Nick. Is it time for a story? It is certainly time for a story. I'd have to thank you for your little mini story there of the origins of Old Tom. An excuse to talk about gin. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> but I have to say, so I think I think we've had enough of those Victorian baddies <laughs> recently. We've okay. we've had we've had quite a lot of them of late. We've had a bit of we've had a bit of a run of Victorian evil doers. We have. So today we're going to go somewhere different. Okay. Are we going to go back? We're going to go back a bit. Back a bit to pre-Victorian times, if you can imagine such a thing. Surely not. And going, we are going to visit 16th century Germany. Hooray! That's my favourite kind of Germany. To tell the story of Peter Nears. Okay. Uh, Do you know about Peter Nears? I don't. I know none of this. He is one of those relatively unknown folks that when you hear this story, you will think, well, how the fuck did I not hear about, uh, have I not <laughs> okay. heard about Peter Nears before? So, 16th century Germany. N- not a fantastically great place to live. To be honest, no. nowhere in the 16th century was a great place to live, unless you had great piles of cash. <laughs> then it was fantastic. <laughs> I'm sensing no piles of cash in this story. No piles of cash involved. So this is long before the unified Germany that we know today. Um, much of the country is split into sort of separate states. There are kingdoms and dukedoms and free cities and bishoprics, all <laughs> under the overarching banner of the Holy Roman Empire. It's very grand. You loved saying all of that. Didn't I did. You? I love a history. <laughs> I love a bit of history. <laughs> Bishop Bricks. Bishop Bricks. That's an excellent term. I loved that. <laughs> well, the Holy Roman Empire at this time encompasses pretty much everything from the, the borders of France, uh, across Germany, through Eastern Europe, right up to the Russian border. So it is a huge um, expanse of land. And, and in the empire, serfdom is still commonplace it is the the way of things the local nobility literally own the peasants who work on their their land um the children the peasants children are born into servitude now at the turn of the 16th century martin luther had kicked off the start of the protestant reformation by nailing his pamphlets onto a church door (laughs) which was sort of like railing against the injustices of the catholic church nails something to a door and just thinks there it is there's my legacy that's all i have to do obviously he did a lot more than that that's the only thing that people remember (laughs) exactly (laughs) and it worked he was railing against the, the church's monopoly on salvation the fact that only through the catholic church could you get into heaven and he thought this was desperately unfair and not at all warranted and there was a feeling of change in the there air was not for the catholics not for the catholics no they were un- very unhappy we about hung this. on to that shit for a very long time <laughs> still do still do so. <laughs> no to all of that yes now in- inspired by some of the the more radical reformers of the time who pre that there there is no need for this hierarchy of priests and bishops that everyone is equal in the eyes of god groups of peasants start to believe that well if if this is true of the church then why shouldn't it be true of everyday life why should they be under the authority of lords and princes and kings and emperors when they could should they should just live free and be left together with their own lives Hmm. Why is this structure in place? So groups of peasants begin to form gangs. <laughs> These gangs combine to form armies. And in 1524, the peasants' revolt begins. Yeah. It is the largest popular uprising that Europe had seen. And it wouldn't see it again until the French Revolution came comes along 250 years later. It's a big deal. I love the peasants' revolt. It, great in principle. <laughs> 
It, it did not go well. <laughs> I know. It's one of those, oh, it went so well in principle, though in the actual enacting of it. In, in the actual things, it was not the success that they had hoped for. But yes, the principle, God love you guys. <laughs> These ragtag armies of peasants, they were armed with shovels and pitchforks and and they attempt to storm castles and monasteries and cities um, and they are massacred in nearly every battle. We have turnips, we'll get you. (laughs) We have cannon, for God's sake. Yes, well, exactly. They are facing well-trained, heavily armed, experienced professional soldiers um, (laughs) and their noble captains and, and such like. And they do not do well they do not fare well um and the aristocracy are are not merciful in their victory Mm. either of the around three hundred thousand peasants who sign up to to fight back a hundred thousand are slaughtered killed in various battles we can see that coming yeah well indeed the the rest are given huge fines that are going to take several lifetimes to pay off and they are sent back to the fields to work this rebellion has lasted less than a year now after this fighting there is or there's chaos across the land many of the men who have been fighting are really not at all happy to simply stick their tail between their legs and go back to life as it had been life as a peasant is is not fun it, it, no it's not a jolly experience it's constant back-breaking labor no pay terrible living conditions who would want to go back to that life peter nears did not want to go back to that life. He was a very, very angry, angry man. With good reason. Well, quite, exactly. He'd been through a hell of a thing, um, survived it, only to be told, nothing is going to change. You've suffered all this, lost countless friends for nothing. Go back to exactly as it was and do what you're told. He's, he's not best pleased with the result. Now, Nears and his friends decide that they can find a better life on the road, fending for themselves, um, and he forms a gang of his own. He starts in the town of Alsace on the German-French border. Lovely wine. Lovely wine. I don't know if they got to sample much of it, but the town had been in the middle of the, the fighting during this uh, rebellion. He and his men ventured into the, the countryside, They hunt along the quiet paths and the tracks that stretch between the isolated towns and villages, um, murdering any travellers that they encounter, stealing every penny that they can find, taking anything of value. But it's not really the ideal that they set out for, but okay, fine. It's not. Well, it's better that than going back to work for someone who doesn't even acknowledge your existence and getting nothing out of it. I know, but don't kill people. <laughs> They've seen horrendous things in in war. Killing to survive is not a new thing for them. Fair enough. So uh, they just take it one step further. Well, we've done it for the, the past nine, twelve months or so in these horrendous battles. So if we need to continue this way of life to give ourselves a better life, then, then we shall. We're not going to go quietly. Now... He is not the only person who thinks like this, and crime rates skyrocket. Um, lawlessness spreads, and bandits roam the countryside. <laughs> the, 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 the nobles are much more concerned with re-establishing their, their control over their own lands, their towns, and things like that. Dominance at, at home is much more important to them than worrying about what's going on in the wider world. <laughs> so the wider world gets increasingly violent and dangerous. Now, Nears isn't the first to form his band of bandits um he has been inspired by uh, an infamous gang leader named martin steer who in a previous life had been a shepherd but like many others was not all that keen to return to his shepherding ways so he organized 48 fellow shepherds into a gang of highwaymen that's a, that's a big leap there's a <laughs> lot there's a lot of shepherds going on there yeah, we know how to steer sheep but now you have to overpower people with guns yep um okay yep. but remember they've they've been fighting in a war they know violence this is a time where violence is commonplace people will be much used to fighting um yes. than we are now so i don't think it would have been as a huge a leap as it would be for someone now back then i think it would have been a, a smaller step steer and his gang claim to have traveled all the way to the coast of the netherlands from germany which is a huge distance and they were murdering and robbing and pillaging as they go eventually after a 22 year crime spree he is caught and executed in 1572 so he's incredibly successful okay but before he is caught 
he mentors Peter Near and teaches him everything that he knows. Oh. Slight aside now as well. Okay. <laughs> when I was reading about Martin Steer, there was a rather interesting bit from a little quote from a historian who had written about him, saying that apparently shepherding was considered a really dishonourable trade at the, at the time. It's, it's very much looked down upon. He seems to think that, it, well... It attracts those who want nothing to do with society. Um, they want to be off by themselves somewhere, living up a hill. So therefore they must be untrustworthy. What? Well, that was the, st- the strange logic behind it. But because yeah. they, 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 chose to, they chose to remove themselves from, from community, but from you society. You don't have by a lot of after- choice with cattle or sheep. You can't farm them in the middle of a town. No, indeed. But it's the people who chose that, who choose that career okay, path. the people who choose that career path are weird and psychopaths <laughs> so okay. they say well that casts a horrible light on all of the farmers i know <laughs> again we're talking perhaps we've got a few hundred years difference no between no then there's, then no, and difference. there's no, no difference there's no difference They're it's, it's, it's entirely it's entirely true so Nears and his group of 24 bandits terrorised the European countryside for years. They, they stole from and murdered travellers on remote highways. The, the gang would split up to make small targeted attacks, or then they would band together to take down larger adversaries. They were quite well organised. Eventually, the gang becomes so confident in their success that rather than just ambush groups on the road, they march into towns and villages to, to murder, rape and steal and demand payment to leave. They have got such a okay. reputation that if you don't pay us, we're not going anywhere and we're going to kill you all. Well, that's ballsy. Well, it's ballsy and it works. They have built up such a, a reputation amongst them. So the, the, this gang travels hundreds of miles across Germany, Western France and the Rhineland up into Bavaria. So it's covering hundreds of miles that they travel and wherever they go, their reputation precedes them. The stories of their crimes and, and evil doings spread. And it creates a, a, a bogeyman that everyone is a f- terrified to encounter. Mm. In 1577, one of Nears's gang, a chap named Peter Obluff, is captured near the town of Gersbach in Germany. The, now, the authorities know that this man was a member of the Nears gang um, and well aware of the fearsome reputation that these bandits have. And if Oblath was here, then the rest of the gang are not far away. And... Despite the fear that this inspires, knowing that they were so close, they also know that they have an opportunity and an advantage. Oblath has to have valuable information. Particularly, where are they? Where are they hiding? And under torture, Peter Oblath um, draws up a list of 14 names, including Peter Nears of the gang members, and gives them detailed instructions about where they can be found. Okay. Again, under torture, you're going to say whatever you... Yes, you're going to say, they, they're they here, find them at my auntie's house, it's fine. <laughs> Have these keys, I don't know what they open, go. Go for it, absolutely. Now, Nears and the rest of the gang are surprised one night um, as they are resting in their camp and they are all arrested under very unpleasant torture. Nears confesses to 75 murders. Oh. Including the deaths of many local women um, and probably any other local murders that they don't have a suitable culprit for. Let's pin it on him. With this confession, they have him. He is doomed. Execution is imminent. But he escapes. (gasps) We have no idea how he escapes, but he one day... Please, can it be that he went, look over there, and then just ran. Look over there, <laughs> and he ran. But he he disappears into the night, avoiding the inevitable execution that was waiting for him. <laughs> now, the authorities are furious and horrendously embarrassed by this. They have been spreading it far and wide to anyone who would listen. They have caught the dreaded Peter Nears, the fearsome Peter Nears and his gang. We have them. They have sent messengers to other towns and those towns have sent messages to other towns further afield saying that this man who has plagued Europe for years um, has been caught and is about to die for his crimes. If it is now revealed that the, the this town has lost him it's going to be humiliating. Jobs and I mean and probably heads are going to roll but how do they get out of this situation and, and escape the shame of, of, of being the, either the guard who let him escape or the warden whose prison wasn't secure or the, the town mayor mm. who's just really fucked up. <laughs> he has help 
of course he has help. That is the only possible explanation. Yeah. But I mean, but not just any old help. He has help from the devil himself. <gasps> no, surely not. That's the only possible way. No one way. was sleeping on the job. No, the devil. The devil rode in. The devil helped him. The devil came to his rescue. Okay, how did he do it? How did he do it? Now, so now this man has already confessed to killing 75 people. Sure. Yes, been under torture, so many of them may well have been false confessions. But there is no question he was not a pleasant man. So you would think that perhaps this reputation was fearsome enough. But no, 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 no. When you have the devil on your side, oh, then the, the, the sky really is the limit for evil <laughs> endeavours. And, and soon after his escape, pamphlets and books and songs all start to spread telling of things far 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 worse than the simple simple murder always trust a pamphlet and a song absolutely it's all you have at the time make sure that you are slandered in song yep there's not enough of that these days i mean it's like getting your only source of news is the daily mail it is <laughs> in song form <laughs> that's the only view of the world you have and it will be a terrifying place <laughs> the side panel of shame sung out to you through the streets and lo there she was she has not got the makeup on <laughs> A collection of pamphlets is published between 1577 and 1583 by a chap called Johann Wick. Is, oh my God, is he John Wick? Well, potentially, actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he may well be the first ever true crime reporter. <laughs> uh, I mean, he, he follows tales and the stories of, of Peter Nears um, a, across the land and writes his reports about him and takes down the stories that the locals tell him. And he goes into lurid and of course entirely factual detail of course about factual. the things he hears now peter near has some of the devil in the woods near feltsburg okay obviously fine. <laughs> and is in exchange for his immortal soul he has gained all sorts of occult secrets he's learned the ability to call on black magic to help him complete his crimes that the devil also apparently provided financial support for nears and his gang as the devil does well, I mean, I do like the idea of the devil goes to his summonings with a checkbook, sort of, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Make me a pitch, make me a pitch. Make me a pitch. It's, it's like a medieval dragon's den type affair <laughs> going on there. <laughs> so. They're in the woods, they're dancing naked. So yes, I'm in for £100,000. Exactly. That's insane amount of money right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now, Meneers had supposedly learned all these secrets from Martin Steer. Remember him, the, she the shepherd turned bandit chap, who had taught Nears not only the ways of the highwayman, but also trained him well in the arts of black magic before his execution. That the pamphlets reveal the secrets of how Nears and his gang had not only been so successful in their marauding, um, but had been able to escape from imprisonment. They were in possession of a very special object. Okay. Magical practitioners from this time believed that candles made from human skin and fat allowed for invisibility and other supernatural powers. Oh, he didn't. These were the, the precursors to what became known as the Hand of Glory. Hand of that glory. were well written about in later centuries. The apparatus that allowed criminals to become invisible. They didn't. Well, I think you'll find they did. He escaped from prison. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so that's it. He had a special magical candle and that's how he got away. That's, that's how he got away. What the what? That's how these things work. What? what? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I do have here the recipe of how to make your very own hand of glory. I thought just in case the casino number one wasn't perhaps to everyone's liking, <laughs> then I would give them something else to make on a, on a Friday evening. Okay, everyone have your mixing bowls at the ready. <laughs> exactly. So so take the, the, the right or left hand of a felon who is hanging from a gibbet um, beside a highway. Absolutely fine. Wrap it in a funeral pall and so wrapped, squeeze it well. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> then put it into an earthenware vessel with uh, zimat, nitra, salt and long peppers um, <sighs> leave it in this vessel for a fortnight and then take it out to, to, and expose it to full sunlight um, during the dog days of summer until it becomes quite dry now I mean if the, if the sun is not strong enough then put it in an oven um, oh, okay, with, okay, with fern okay. so it's nicely dried out um, next, you make a candle from the fat of a, the gibbeted felon, um, mixed with virgin wax sesame. And then you use the, the, the hand as a candlestick to hold the candle. And when lighted into every place that you will go with this baleful instrument, 
you shall remain hidden. So there we go. Nice factual recipe for you to try out. I think it's something that everyone can do. We all have those ingredients in our it house. sounds jolly useful really yeah, it's fine just get the hand of a dead man and what what <laughs> you appear angry at my story i'm not angry at it i'm just <laughs> like who decided at what point the hand of a dead man dried out like sun-dried tomatoes should go to, you know what just do sun-dried tomatoes and see if it works <laughs> So t- turn them into, wrap them around a yes. candle. Just put, turn oh them my into God, a put them on cocktail sticks and make yeah. a hand kind of shape and then guide it through your house and see if no one sees you. Or just see if everyone wants to not acknowledge your existence right then and there <laughs> because you're walking around your house either with a human hand that's on fire or some sun-dried tomatoes on some cocktail sticks and they go, you know what, we just have, have to accept what she's doing with her life. We're just not going to acknowledge it and not look at her. And then you become invisible. <laughs> perhaps perhaps that's what it was. Perhaps it was just people were going... What the fuck's up with this guy? Just ignore her. It'll only encourage her. Ignore him. Ignore him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ignore him. Then he'll go away. <laughs> and the guy's going, I'm invisible. It's awesome. <laughs> so I think that's potentially what it is. Now, while on the run, Nears is reported to have frequently changed his appearance to avoid capture. He gains a reputation as a master of disguise. Among these cunning disguises are a leper, a soldier, and a goat. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big gambit of disguise disguises it's, it's there a... that's a lot to carry in your knapsack <laughs> a leper you've got to have limbs that you just leave around a soldier you're going to have but all the stuff and then a goat you're going to have to have a lot of goat shit going on yep yeah, but no but you have the devil on your side do i do you don't need to like have like a full bone costume um when you've got the devil <sighs> on your side are you basically saying that he walks through towns going la 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 <laughs> waving his hands and he's going look i'm a goat i have I'm a, a devil goat. on my side and everyone's going yeah that's a real good goat mate yeah, yeah absolutely crazy <laughs> there there are several things about nears that apparently never changed no matter what form he, right. he took you, you might imagine that perhaps he would always have a limp or maybe he had some birthmark or a scar or something like that um but no um he was always known always known to carry money two loaded pistols and a broadsword That's distinctive i would dearly love to see the perfectly camouflaged goat um wandering <laughs> through the field with a wallet two pistols and a broadsword strapped to its back and people not noticing a thing out of place on its hind legs yeah, absolutely just act just, just act casual look. act casual i got my pistols loaded anyone looks at me sideways they get a bullet in the head i'm just a goat walking through town but it worked it worked he was not Why? he was not discovered um i don't i don't i don't argue with the fact that he it worked because you're going to look away from that shit the weirdest thing you see in the street you're like this is probably none of my business carry on mate Oh, mate, he probably (laughs) really did think the devil was on his side and everyone was ignoring how crazy he was. (laughs) By this time, Nears is near legendary across most of Central Europe. Such is his (laughs) reputation and the stories that surround him. Oh, the stories, yes. (laughs) When he wasn't openly marauding across the country, he attempts to hide in plain sight using his expertise in disguise magical really? magical or otherwise in 1581 he stops to lodge at the bells inn in neumarket he rests for a few days before finally going out to to wash up at the local bathhouse he leaves his leather pouch with the innkeeper um, for safekeeping telling him that it is particularly valuable to him and he must keep it safe his disguise however is not as good as he thinks it is and some of the townspeople recognize his description and start whispering could this really be peter nears the one they have all heard about they all heard these stories now of course the townspeople are terrified surely nears is here to murder them all and eat their children and steal every shiny thing he can find <laughs> Right. Rather than confront Nears directly, who is enjoying his leisurely bath, oblivious to the mad panic outside, the townspeople confront the innkeeper and force him to open the the leather pouch that Nears has left. Inside are severed human fingers and a dried heart. Now, obviously, instantly realising that these are the possessions of a a serious black magician, they know that this has to be Nears. His reputation is everywhere. It could only be him. 
That's that's a weird thing to leave. It is it is a peculiar thing to to leave in someone else's possession. Perhaps he thought it, it would be safer with the innkeeper than it would at the a public bathhouse. It, it was the olden times. People left all sorts of shit behind the counter, Ab- and that they did. Please take this human foot. I'm going to use it as currency <laughs> later. Now the the townspeople move quickly. They gather eight strong men and send them to <laughs> apprehend Nears um, in the bath. They think he's rather more vulnerable while he's in the bath. <laughs> (laughs) Um, And they do, they grab him. Afterwards, it's believed that the only reason they were able to successfully catch him, well, he's been separated from his magical bag. It's a bag of magic, yes. Oh. If he had had his magical fingers and his dried heart, there is no doubt they would all have been turned to frogs um, or killed in many horrible, horrible ways. Because he would have had the power of the magical bag. Now, seeing these eight men surround him, Nears admits to his identity, but he demands to be taken to the local authorities. No doubt he believes that he stands more of a chance escaping a prison cell, as he has done previously, than he does escaping the mob justice of the of the townspeople. But he probably should have remembered the time he spent in prison before. It it was not pleasant. It was full of spiky, stretchy, smashy things. And during the use of those spiky, stretchy, smashy things, Nears confesses to 544 murders. (laughs) No, he doesn't. Well, he does. He does. But he did not kill that many people. (laughs) Well, that that is is a different thing. That is literally the first (laughs) pinprick in your finger at the moment of discomfort. 544 people have I killed. I will admit to anything else you want. My finger hurts a bit. Yes. <laughs> After this confession, confession? Um, there is no... Is, confession. Confession. Um, there is no, no escaping punishment this time. He is under <laughs> constant watch, chained to a wall. He is not going anywhere. No one can save him this time. Is he literally chained to a wall like, you lucky bastard? Like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> they only hung me the right way up the other day. While he's while he's chained to a wall, the executioners of Neumarket cook up something special for this most evil of men. Oh, no. His execution lasts three days. No. Oh. And this is where it's going to get unpleasant. We're going to go for I'm it. Here for it. I'm here for it. I've, I've run out of drink. Oh. <laughs> On the first day, strips of flesh are peeled from his body and hot oil is poured into the wounds. Ooh, that's not nice. That's, that's It's not nice, but this has the, sort of the twofold effect of causing horrendous agony. Pain, but cauterizing? But also stops the bleeding. Yes. So he will just, he's going to last just a little bit longer. A little bit longer. Just a little bit it's longer. It's moisturising as well. Just... <laughs> On the second day, no. his feet are smeared with grease no. and he is suspended no. above glowing coals. Oh and roasting the bottom oh. half of his body. Oh, I thought you were going to say like they were suspended above pigs or something, or goats. No, 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 uh, roasting coals, oh, this one, not, not a pig. Oh, no, is it worse? Oh, I don't know. I, well, I don't know. Oh, they're but smeared with fat, so they, oh, so they will have a higher temperature. So it temperature. goes all, oh, yeah. Or cooked feet. Goes all crackly cooked and feet. cooked feet and legs. And it's, no, it's not going to be jolly. Oh. On the third day... So the 16th of September, 1581, he is strapped to the braking wheel. Ah, the wheel. We have encountered the wheel before. We do like the wheel. <laughs> the executioner delivers 42 <gasps> blows down on his body f- and forces his shattered limbs through the spokes of the wheel. <sighs> he is still alive. Uh-uh. People believe that his pact with the devil is so strong that the devil himself will not let him die. Really? Eventually, the executioner potentially gets bored with all this <laughs> thing <laughs> and takes up his axe yes. and hacks Nears to pieces. And finally, he is dead. Now, the diff- difficulty of going this far back is is how do you separate fact from folklore? Uh, uh, mm. <laughs> well, we may have had a bit of both in this story. There are no official court documents. The only evidence no, is we that, have that is... he was a witch? All we have is these says, pamphlets, the remnants of songs and folk stories. Did Peter Nears make a pact with the devil? Become invisible? Turn into a pistol-toting, broadsword-wielding goat? <laughs> I, I, th- I think th- I think that is unlikely. I have to say, I'll, I'll, let's um, hold judgment. Did he really kill five hundred and forty-four people? No. Again, under torture, you're going to say pretty much anything to make it stop. So that potentially could be taken with a pinch of salt. But was Peter Nears a vicious, opportunistic killer, the leader of a gang of bandits and thugs who killed, raped, and thrived their way across the country? Then yes, he he probably was. 
And that is my story this week. Da, da, the story da. of Peter Nears. Da, da, da. Oh, good story, Nick. Well, that 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 developed, didn't it? Well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it went. It goes on, and it goes. Oh, that it gets a bit weird. Yes, I was just kind of like, oh, okay, this is a person. Oh my God, what? <laughs> now, did he kill five hundred people? Uh, no. Five hundred forty-four. Five hundred forty-four people. people. I love the idea that after a while or after five minutes he admitted to 544 people i don't mind whatever it is if if you probably threatened me with torture i would confess to killing 544 (laughs) people you wouldn't have to get the spiky thing anywhere near me you just said i'm gonna put that somewhere present yeah i did it you should know that i have a particular set of skills and my particular set of skills <laughs> is to admit to absolutely anything. Absolutely anything. I will <laughs> admit to anything and I will <laughs> let you kill me before I even experience any pain. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a crazy thing that if he's, you know, the past that he's come from, from this revolutionary, I would say, past, if he's marauding across the country, eh, you know, whether it comes from noble causes or not, he's still possibly raping and pillaging his way across the country. Yeah, that, that is, that is un, I think that is, uh, that is unquestioned. That, that certainly happened. But is he that much of a kid? It doesn't seem like from your story that he was that much of a crazed killer, that he was a I mean, murderer. Uh, it was just, no. it seems very political. I mean, absolutely. I mean, all the, all the accounts come after his escape right. after his initial capture and go. escape where everyone is there then looks like everyone is trying to cover their back in a very cynical way that it that is what it is and the only way they could escape the embarrassment of him having escaped is to claim supernatural abilities or supernatural assistance um, that let him escape but then create him as a, as a figure of folklore create him as Absolutely. some sort of horrible witchy terrible figure that it's very easy to paint him as the villain and it, it does it does oh, feel sure. like back then it does feel like it's a bit of a political move i mean it is we talked about in patreon we talked about sawney bean you know sawney yes. bean is very much probably a character that was created to go the scots are evil <laughs> by the english this is a guy that he's escaped power. So, uh, okay, fine. He's just a witch. Let's burn him for our people. There's no doubt that, yes, he, he existed and he was a an unpleasant man. There is no doubt about that. But I think perhaps his, his crimes may have been slightly exaggerated. I mean, I 100% believe the goat business. I believe I mean, the, the goat business was classic. One of the main reasons I did this story is when I read about the goat. I thought that's... <laughs> It has, to, it has to be told. The people need to hear about the broadsword-wielding goat. The, the broadsword-wielding goat, <laughs> it's 100%. Been, I don't know how anyone could not believe that. It's great. Remember when I read that? It was like, oh, he turned himself into a... He disguised himself as, as a leper and a soldier. And you're thinking, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I can imagine yes, he could yes. do that. And he could do that. And then a goat. And you go, what? <laughs> what, what did I just read? <laughs> a goat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People probably were just like, yes, he did do this. And he really thought he could do it. He really, (laughs) really did. And we've all just let him get away with it. Uh, There's no need to torture him. That was just a weird quirk he had. (laughs) Oh, God. A crazy character. I love it. I love it. What do you think, people? Do you know the story? Do you believe the goat business? (laughs) Do you believe how many people he killed? Do you believe in all the politics behind it? And what do you think about the methods of torture and death back at that time? Because, (laughs) good God, it was not justified by any stretch of the imagination. But, God, we love those kind of deaths. (laughs) We shouldn't say it. It's awful. But, wow, what a way to go. You would not want to go that way. If you want that value for three days standing in the mud getting your peanuts... Because you probably would have paid to see that. I'm sure, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure there would have been a whole industry around it of, of ent- in the quiet bits. You want some jugglers and some, <laughs> probably some 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 prostitutes and things like that, sort of entertaining people on the sides and, and stuff like oh, that. Nick, I love the way you said. I wish some jugglers and some prostitutes, like just mixing family Mix- and absolutely. adults. There. <laughs> I, th- I think I think that's probably entirely true. Um, <laughs> some yeah, some of the local tavern people coming out with their. 
gallons of beer and things like that. With their yeah. pints and their coins. Let's just see this three. It's like a festival. It back is, then, absolutely. Wasn't it? Oh my God. And the main act was the wheel. Yeah. That was it. They were waiting for that day three, <laughs> like their headliner on the, on the third day. That is quite good. What do you think, people? What would be your three day torture? Oh festival? God. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your three day torture festival? Fuck's sake. <laughs> Mm-hmm. They're flexing their knuckles right now. But what do you think of the story? Tell us your theories. Jump onto the comments on social media about this story, about any other stories that you want us to cover. Tell us your thoughts, your feelings, your deep, darkest worries about what happened just here. And make sure you try a casino number one. The recipe will be out on social media this evening. A simple, beautiful cocktail and so, so good. If you don't fancy the casino number one for whatever reason, perhaps you're not a fan of gin, um, we may also post the recipe for the Hand of Glory. If you fancy giving one of those a go, <laughs> then I would very much like to see your pictures, see what you come up with. That'll be good. Improvise <laughs> and we would be happy to see it. Join us on Patreon if you haven't already ready and tell all your friends about our beautiful podcast and make sure they leave reviews thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisoner's cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you bye bye